This is Teapot from Sports Card Investor, and I'm loving the content here on Sports Card Strategy Show and the NoOffSeason.com Sports Card Network. Be sure to subscribe for year-round advice on keeping your portfolio up to date because there is no off-season. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Kelsey from Nash Cards, and you are watching the Sports Card Strategy Show where there is no off-season. What's up, everybody? I'm Paul Hickey with NoOffSeason.com. This is the Sports Card Strategy Show brought to you by Graybo's Sports Cards. Graybo's Sports Cards is a local card shop located in Richmond, Virginia, and is owned by Gray Burnett, Ryan Fitz, and Duke Dodson, who you know is Denny one time. Graybo's sports the best selection of singles in the mid-Atlantic and a wide variety of wax. Graybo's is happy to announce that they are now the only direct buyer of Topps Bowman in Central Virginia and are now breaking daily on Fanatics Live. They are moving to their new larger shop, which will be connected to the hottest sports bar in Richmond in the near future. Stay tuned for those details. Listeners of Sports Card Strategy Show can use the promo code GRABOS20 to get $20 off their first purchase with GRABOS on Fanatics Live. Don't forget to get a free 30-day trial at NoOffSeason.com today to help you make money flipping sports cards, build your sports card investment portfolio, get unlimited advice from our experts, and take sports card school to navigate the hobby. That's NoOffSeason.com. Get your free 30-day trial today. All the data we use on the Sports Card Strategy Show is from MarketMoversApp.com. Use code NOOFFSEASON at MarketMoversApp.com to get 20% off for life after a free 14-day trial. All right, let's get to the Sports Card Strategy. What's What is up? up? How we doing, ladies and gentlemen? Connor Barn. Oh. How we doing, ladies and gentlemen? Connor Barnett here, head of content, NOOFFSEASON.com. Sorry for the hiccup there. Looked like I was muted, and then I wasn't. I'm alongside my man, Paul Hickey, pumped to be back for another episode of the Sports Card Strategy Show, your spot to get uh, sports card investment advice to help you build a portfolio that ultimately increases in value over time. Paul, how are we doing on this fine Wednesday? I'm ready to talk to you, Connor. I'm excited, man. Good to be back. I know we've both been in the lab quite a bit. It's good to be back in front of the nooffseason.com fam and talk some sports cards. A lot going on, man. Excited to get into it today. Totally. We got a full slate for you guys. We're going to talk about what to do with your Anthony Edwards and Palo Bancaro uh, prints. When is the right time to sell those guys? We've got an invest or fade segment with a sleeper uh, and a mega flyer QB. We got Paul's eBay tip of the day that we kind of stumbled upon. Uh, well, Paul stumbled upon really last night when we were talking about selling Jackson Churio. Uh, Bundle builder. We're going to talk about what Paul will pick. It's kind of a variation of our 1K budget builder. And then, of course, we will wrap the show up with audience Q&A. So be sure to drop your questions in the live chat along with your wins of the week. Uh, and we will answer during the audience Q&A segment at the end of the show. Guys, if you like the show uh, and the content we put out on a weekly basis, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. It's a fantastic way to support what we are doing. All right, Paul, I'm going to hop into some live chat love real quick before we hit on some housekeeping and then hop into the show. We got Mountain Lake cards and games in the house. Thanks for being here. Sports Card Lounge. First time catching you live. I always love seeing those. Rusty and McGart, what's up, Sports Car Strategy fam? Sell those Cheerios. That's right, guys. Be sure to be signed up for our sell alerts. We sent one out yesterday, 1-833-992-5727. Time to move those Jackson Cheerios, as he will be starting uh, roughly 10 days from now, uh, right out of spring training. Justin Stewart in the house. Happy Wednesday, folks. We got Barry Siff. Barry, good to see you. Joe Reinch, good morning all. Shane Graham and Hoosier card guy. Also, Sergeant Slab in the house and chuck g says happy hump day guys we're pumped to have you all here excited for all the stuff we're going to get into today i think it's going to be a lot of entertaining discussion uh and a little bit of variation from the usual wednesday shows uh but paul i will let you take away some housekeeping before we hop into things yeah i mean i think most importantly happy birthday to connor barnett head of content at nooffseason.com yesterday was his birthday um and we're taking him out tonight we're taking him out tonight, have a little birthday dinner. Excited about that. So it'll be good to see you in person, my friend. And uh, everybody say happy birthday to Connor. And guys, you know, 
the nooffseason.com fam is growing. We appreciate all of you. You all make the show what it is. So want to give all of you a shout out. And I'm excited as we get into selling season. I know Rusty and McGart was talking about our Jackson Cheerio sell alert yesterday that Connor whipped up um, on the on the nose. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But I'm going to be fully transparent throughout the next, uh, well, I'm always fully transparent, but throughout the next several episodes, I'm going to get into more of what I'm doing in my eBay account. So we'll talk a little bit about that later today. And then on Monday's episode, I'm going to really dive into my selling strategy. So I'm excited to get to that with you guys. But Connor has an amazing show planned for today. But first, are you ready to start grading your cards? CGC Cards is the perfect place to slab your favorite football cards from their crystal clear holders to their affordable pricing. CGC Cards is the perfect stop for your grading needs. Go to cgccards.com to start grading today. Of course, as all of you probably know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you right now, I have never graded any of my cards with CGC, not because I don't believe in what they're doing. I absolutely do. But PSA sells best on the secondary market, and that's what I care most about. So I'm always grading all of my cards with PSA, not to say that I won't grade some cards with CGC at some point, but I want to be fully transparent with all of you that I grade with PSA. Let's talk about Sports Card School real quick. Sports Card School is a safe place for newbies, advanced flippers, and high rollers alike to learn how to navigate the hobby, this great, phenomenal hobby that we're all in together, and ultimately build a collection that increases in value because, guys, if you do it the other way around and your collection doesn't increase in value, you're probably going to leave the hobby. So we want to keep you in the hobby. Go to sportscardschool.com. You can get a free 30-day trial at nooffseason.com today to learn our guidelines, strategies, and plays to help you make money flipping sports cards to fund your PC and your life. And guys and gals, there is a new member dashboard feature, which I'm excited about. As many of you know, I am also a web developer. So sometimes when I go in the lab, I think about how can I make the website better, especially for the premium members. So I, I stumbled upon something last night and this morning, whipped a little something up. Let me know what you guys think of the new member dashboard. All right, Connor. That's all I got for the housekeeping stuff, man. Back over to you because you have a phenomenal question of the day teed up. I am pumped for this question of the day. What do you got? Yeah, so I mean, this show is all about trying to help people make money flipping sports cards. We talk different strategies. We give our advice. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes from your experiences, Paul, which is nice because we're not making things up, right? We, it comes from experience. And everyone has their own experiences. Everyone has their own why. Uh, and ultimately, everyone has their own different little strategies and little tricks and gimmicks to help themselves make money. Uh, so my question of the day is, what piece of advice would you give someone just entering the hobby to help them make money flipping sports cards? Comment at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey after this video, after this live stream is done. Comment on the actual video or on the pin post on Instagram at sports card strategy. What piece of advice would you give someone just entering the hobby? Uh, Paul, for you, what do you think if you had one piece of advice that you could give someone entering the hobby? I'm curious what your what your advice would be. It might shock you, but, and I'll be honest, it's probably not something I would follow if somebody gave me this advice, but, and it's probably not something that, you know, if I had to go back and do it all over again, that I would do, and it's probably going to be hard for all of you to follow if you're just entering the hobby, but honestly, it would be don't buy anything for like upwards of the first year that you're in it. And I know that sounds crazy. But I want people who enter the hobby to strategically browse, uh, especially people who collected at a younger age and now have disposable income, which actually is most of our audience. Most of our audience are people who have disposable income and want to put it into sports cards to make money flipping, which is great. But I want you to strategically browse for like three months, six months, even 12 months. Uh, you'll thank me later. And if you go to nooffseason.com, you'll learn more about why I say that and, and keep listening to the Sports Card Strategy Show. But we've already got some great um, answers on the Instagram post as well. Curious to see, Connor, what your piece of advice uh, would be to someone entering the hobby, considering you know, you, you've been 
a sports fanatic and, and like a very well educated sports fanatic for your entire life, basically. And you collected as a kid as well. So it's not that you're really new to the hobby, but you're relatively new to sports card flipping. And um what would yours be? Like what what's in the what's in your mind when you when you came up with this question? Because I think it's a phenomenal question. I really want people to answer at sports card strategy on Instagram or drop a comment below at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. I think you should invest in a sport in the sports that you love, right? And first of all, I love where yours is at. And I incidentally did what you said. Like I didn't buy anything for the first couple of months and now I'm kind of getting active, but love where yours is at. I think mine is like invest in something that you love. And the reason that I say that is not just because to have fun. I think it's because you're likely to do better in something you're more confident that you're investing in and know more about. All right. So like for me, I'm just focused on basketball, uh, even though it's not always basketball season. And even though we talk about basketball being harder to invest in, uh, it's easier for me to be focused on basketball because I just know more about the sports. I feel like I can time the market better. I feel like I know the players better. I feel like I can identify what cards are undervalued and have true upside better. Uh, so I think that would be my thing. Look, it, look for the start in the place that you feel comfortable investing in. Yeah. And I got two more little pieces of advice that would be kind of like, I guess, one B and one C, which would be one B would be um, when you're looking at pricing and you say, okay, well you could buy this card for X, Y, Z amount. And then you could have sold it for ABC amount. That sales price is one thing, but actually executing that sale is a whole other. So being set up to sell takes time. You have to ramp up to that. And we talk a lot about that at Sports Card School. That's actually one of the reasons why we launched Sports Card School at NoOffSeason.com is because it's easy to be like, well, I'm going to buy this card because it's low and I'm going to sell it at the selling marker when it's going to go up. But then actually executing the sale is much harder than saying, I'm going to buy it now because there's a selling marker. So and then number three is just real quick because it's relevant today is I got this Carson Beck uh, auto refractor in the mail out of $4.99. Shout out Buckeye Dill, who, who's also buying Carson Beck. And we've added him to nooffseason.com to the player ranking, so go check that out. But number three is like when you do sell a card, like, like package it well. Um, because like this person, uh, for those of you listening, this person like didn't put cardboard uh on either side of the top loader which quite frankly i'm lucky that the card's not damaged like the card does not look the da it doesn't look damaged always open your packages as soon as possible um and and when you when you, there's a lot of hobby tips here there's a lot of tips for beginners but uh pa package them better than this when you sell them too i mean for those of you listening like no cardboard old and like half of an old envelope reused everything i'm I'm all about reusing packing materials people but look put some cardboard in there protect to protect the card for crying out loud um yeah a lot of a lot of advice for newbies for more check out sportscardschool.com but uh yeah we want to know what your advice would be to someone just entering the hobby great question connor again comment at youtube.com slash paul hickey or our pin post on ig right now at sports card strategy let's get into your agenda here my man you want to go into some basketball card talk so what do you got for us here of course i do real quick wanted to give a shout out to perk sport your card said it is their birthday today happy birthday perk thanks for spending your day uh, of birth with us at the sports card strategy show thanks for everyone uh, for the love in the live chat as well on the birthday wishes also those of you dropping your advice in the live chat thanks be sure to drop them at youtube.com slash paul hickey as well all right paul like you mentioned we got some basketball talk to kick things off Anthony Edwards and Paolo Bancaro are two guys, especially Paolo as of late, that we've talked about buying uh, just because we believe undervalued with high upside and low risk ultimately. And they're on the move. And we don't mean trade talk. You know, um, Paolo Bancaro's 2022 Prism Silver and PSA 10 is up 14.6% over the last 14 days across 19 sales. Uh, so up from about $240 on average over $280. Uh, Paul, I personally would not be moving him yet unless maybe I was the person who paid $216 on March 4th for this card, uh, or even if I was someone that paid $211 on February 24th. However, 
And this is a conversation that me and you have been having a lot lately, Paul, about several different cards is what is the opportunity cost of holding this card, waiting for more upside relative to moving it and being able to hop into different plays that potentially are more discounted and have more upside. Um, so that's the question here for me with Paulo. You know, do we think NBA playoff hype will help see this card continue to rise? Paul, my answer is yes. Pella's already rising, uh, like we've mentioned, this specific card, which I like using the Prism Silvers as kind of a baseline. We talk about it a lot. It's kind of just the right card. It has a lot of good uh, features in terms of pricing, liquidity, pop counts, desirability, things like that. Um, so, yes, I mean, we're already seeing Paulo rise in terms of pricing with little media attention and uh, basically no national coverage, which is preposterous to me considering he was a former number one pick and is playing fantastic. Uh, and yes, anyone listening right now, I'm eating my words from several months ago when I was like, I'm just not big on Paolo. I don't think he's that guy. He seems to be that guy. Uh, the Magic are fifth in the East at 41 and 28, which means they are playoff inbound, which means that our sell marker being the playoffs selling at an auction prior to the playoff game starting where you're not even waiting for a performance based spike to help out uh, is still very active, which means that I think that you should be holding on to this card um, as long as there is more upside. Now, for those of you that really want cash flow back, at what point should you feel comfortable selling this card? It depends on the situation, right? What price point did you get in? Like I mentioned prior, there were a couple of people that paid 200, around 200 $215 for this card. Uh, so, you know, so that's some healthy upside even after fees and taxes. Um, how bad do you need your cash flow back? Are you bad? Do you need it bad enough to where you're willing to cut yourself off from additional profits? Bad enough to list before the sell marker? Uh, I'm hoping not. My takeaway here from Palo Bancaro is starting to rise. Uh, is not that you should be selling before the marker. It's that uh, this is just kind of the beginning of the trend that we've been waiting for. Uh, Paul, curious to get your thoughts on where Paolo is at right now. Yeah, great discussion here. I do love Paolo right now as well. You know, I talked about him. I talked about fading him back in November, like early November. We talked about him on the Sports Card Strategy Show. And if you follow his pricing movement, between November and I believe last month, I said with you that he's a buy. And I still think he's a buy for all the reasons you mentioned. Um, to go from you know 216 to up near 280, that's nice. So if you were that person who paid 216, I could see selling it, but I could see really only selling it. And I say this from personal experience, I could see really only moving it if you're at a card show and you can get all the cash and avoid the eBay fees. Or if you're on a Discord or a Facebook group and you could get a transaction through PayPal goods and services from a you know trusted buyer that you've transacted with in the past to avoid the eBay fees, because then you'd be looking at, you know, around a $50, $55 profit. If you're gonna sell that on eBay right now for $280, those eBay fees are going to crush you and you're really not going to make that much money. And I do agree that that card's going to continue to go up and that the sell, the real, for that card, we talk a lot, especially with the one-on-one -on -one strategist people about how do we, how do we take a card from around the $300 mark to up closer to a thousand dollars for that to happen? I really think Paolo is going to have to like take the magic to the NBA finals. Totally. And as we all know, because I say it all the time on this show, I am not good at predicting that. So I am not saying that that's going to happen. So I think realistically what this card does is it probably goes up to around 350 max during the NBA playoffs. But that's a great profit margin. If you can even go from you know, 250, 260, 280 up to 350 and you're moving it even eBay to eBay fees and fees, you're still making money. So I think this is a, is kind of a sweet spot type card in terms of like what we would call a quick flip, couple month quick flip. Uh, I think it's safe too, because even if it doesn't pan out well for Paolo in the playoffs, he's still a guy you're going to want to have a Prism Silver PSA 10 rookie for heading into next season with this young Magic team. So I like it. I think I think this is a buy. I think it's on it's going to continue to be on the rise. And for the record, this is why sports card flipping works and will continue to work. This is why it works because if you are moving it now, you're leaving meat on the bone for somebody else to make money on it later in a couple of months. And if you're moving it now, you made money because you bought it lower than what you're selling it for, right? And if if you're moving it to break even, stop, take the listing down and wait for two months and then you'll make money on it. This is why 
flipping sports cards works and will continue to work because of cards like this, players like this, situations, timing the market like this. Yeah, really well put. I think that I think at the end of the day, this takeaway for me is that it's great to see this card moving. But like Paul's saying, this could still be a buy right now. It's good to see the card moving. Don't panic sell it and uh, just because you're seeing green after all those fees and make 10 or 15 bucks when there's a lot more upside. The Magic are locked for the playoffs. All you got to do is list in an auction. Uh, Paul, I'm saying that probably ends right before the first game, especially if they're playing the Knicks, like Christopher Bell is saying. Uh, could be some increased exposure there. Get in an auction that's listing right before that first game. That's what I would do to mitigate risk there. What are you thinking in terms of trying to sell this during the playoffs, Paul? Yeah, I would be in the same boat as you. And and just to add to your point about mitigating risk, it's right. But also, you have to ask yourself, how long do I want to hold this card for? Because if you're if you're not going to list it for auction, and you're going to list it in a buy it now or best offer format during that time period, you risk the card not selling. And then you risk having to hold that card all the way through the NBA off season. Probably your next selling marker isn't, in, isn't going to be until the first week of the NBA season in 2024, 2025 season at the end of October, which is going to give you a slight hype rise but it may not go up uh, much from where it is right now. Like basically your, that playoff series might be your chance to profit before you have to wait to see how Paolo does for a whole other season, which when you're playing the flipping game that we're all playing at the sports card strategy show and nooffseason.com, that can be a bit of a bogey. That can be a bit, a bit, a bit of a hindrance because you've got money tied up in a card longer that's why we say execute the sale that's why we send out the sell alerts text sports cards to 1-833-992-5727 that's why we push people to those seven to ten day auctions at the at those times that's how you pit people up against each other raise the price when there's maximum interest in the player and you move on from the card and move into something else yeah and I think that's where kind of opportunity cost comes in, Paul. You know, when we were at Culture Collision, I got that John Morant PSA 10 Prism Silver for 350 bucks, And I was almost at the point where I was like, well, it's going for above $500 right now. Do I just put this thing on eBay and move it for 500 Because at that point, I know he's out until next year. I've got to wait until all of next year because now the card's back down near what I paid for it, right? So now I have to wait until all of next year to get that cash flow back. And yeah, it's not a huge deal in terms of amount of cash flow, but it, it, it could be a big deal in terms of how many other plays could I have been making in that time. So that's kind of where opportunity cost comes in. Uh, and people, we've got some thinking to do here with Anthony Edwards in terms of opportunity costs um, as his 2020 Prism Silver PSA 10 is up 37% over the last 14 days. That's across 24 sales. Uh, so up from roughly $450 up above 620 bucks. Um, Ant-Man's been cooking late guys, extreme highlights, insane block to win the game versus the Thunder where he hit his head on the rim. And now his preposterous poster over John Collins. People are comparing his play style to Michael Jordan himself. Um, he's kind of rapidly coming along as a legit face of the league. Uh, so what should you guys be doing with your Anthony Edwards Prince right now? I know a lot of our uh, listeners have this card, Paul, you have this card right now. Uh, and we've been talking at the last two card shows about what the heck should you be doing with this card? Because everyone is interested in this card and they're interested in your Darius Garland Kaboom. Uh, I think the answer, and, and like, I feel like I have to talk you out of moving this thing. But at the end of the day, I feel like there's such long-term upside that it's tough. But I'm saying that there's no wrong move here with Ant-Man. I'm curious to get your feedback once I'm done here, Paul. But I don't think there's a wrong answer. Short-term flippers can sell now, avoid risk, take their 35% and move along into another investment like we talk uh, like we were mentioning, kind of get away from uh, cutting into opportunity. Uh, we likely would recommend this for a large majority of our listeners simply as a measure of mitigating risk uh, and allowing yourself the opportunity to go where they ain't, go in a different direction where something's discounted and potentially has more upside. Those that want to hold on for a little bit longer can also uh, be in a good spot as you can hang tight for the NBA playoffs where Ant-Man will likely see a strong boost uh, based on league hype without even having to play a minute of playoff basketball. You, we were talking about sell markers with Palo. Um, and then you got the long-term flippers, guys that don't want to move this card yet. I think you're in a good boat, too. Um, this guy could be a lock for a top player in the league for years to come. I wouldn't be surprised if this card ends up being uh, selling for over $1,000 at some point between now and this time next year. I think he is that good. Uh, I think with this Anthony Edwards Prism Silver, you're in a spot where it's very difficult to lose. Paul, what would you be doing? You actually have this card. What are you doing? Give me your feedback. Yeah, and many of our one-on-one -on -one 
strategist members have this card as well because I recommended that they buy it uh, over the last several months. And it's a good thing it's up. So I guess I was right. It's up 36.8% over the last 14 days. Um, yeah, th you're right. There's This is a card that you can't really lose with. It's a tough decision. And it, it does depend on what you got into it for, right? So I mentioned a lot of the one-on-one -on -one people. The one-on-one -on -one people likely got into it for around, you know, somewhere between 500 and 550 dollars right so if they were to sell it on ebay right now they would be up which is great but they wouldn't be up that much so because i believe in ant-man and i have talked on this show for two years plus about how much i love anthony edwards at one point he was consistently number one overall on our sports card rankings at nooffseason.com like he probably has the record for most weeks at number one um, consecutively. And so he's still up there because of all the reasons that you stated. I believe he's a top five player in the NBA long term. I believe that he will have playoff success. He's already been to the playoffs a couple of times and they've built that team around him. It may not happen this year where he takes the T-Wolves deep into the playoffs because of the cat injury. But on the other hand, you've mentioned this on the sports card strategy show. He could be featured even more unleashed as, as the scorer that he is with cat out. And so I think this card is special because of his upside, his upside as an, as an individual player and face of the league is what makes this card special from all the other cards that we talk about. And this is the one card, one of the cards one of the few cards that I would be okay just telling people to hold until it does get up to $1,000. I think for this year, for it to get to $1,000, he is going to have to do something ridiculous in the playoffs and take the T-Wolves far. I think for it to be a $1,000 card two years from now is very likely. So the question is, how much are you into it for and what are your other goals for me, I've got a lot of other cards. I've got a lot in my sports card bankroll because I'm constantly moving things around. So I'm okay holding this card. Um, I'm not, you know, as you know, I've had offers and I'm only into this card a couple hundred dollars. Why? Because I bought a HGA 9.5. I cracked it out and I got a PSA 10. So I'm only into this card for a couple hundred dollars. I could sell it right now and make a really decent profit but I think I'm going to hold it just because of its upside, just because I know what a Giannis PSA 10 looks like from 2013, let alone a, a Giannis silver. We're talking about Anthony Edwards silver. I know what a Jason Tatum silver price wise looks like PSA 10 from 2017. And I think Ant-Man's up there with those guys. So let's hold this for a while, guys, unless, unless you're into it, for a couple $300 and you really need the cash. I think we're waiting for the sell alert. And if he does take the T-Wolves far into the playoffs, there may be one. When this card goes, when this card 2Xs or 2.5 or 3Xs from where it is now, there's going to be a sell alert. So I typically say, don't be greedy. Take the money when you can. I think this is a special scenario where you hold. And oh, by the way, Connor, if you do the math, we as we all know, People at card shows want to pay 80% of comps. 80% of $625 is $500. So if you're going to try to move this at a card show, you're probably breaking even right now. And if you're trying to move it on eBay, you're going to be up, but not up by much. So I'm holding this. That's my answer. Yeah, I like it. It's just, it's just such a good spot. And I want to touch... Real quick, I know we don't talk actual player analysis a whole lot, Paul, but I wanted to hit on Perk, uh, sport your cards real quick. Ant-Man couldn't hit the game tying shot last night. I see clutch problems and an inconsistent jumper. Uh, I mean, he did have the game-winning block right before that. Uh, and then also, one of the reasons that I believe in Ant-Man like trending towards a top player in the league and why I'm willing to comp this card to something like Luka Doncic's Prism Silver that's actually down right now and still selling for near $1,100 is because I think he will be a face of the league like Luka, right? And I'm not worried about, he's saying inconsistent jumper, potential clutch. I don't think there's clutch problems, but for the inconsistency, 
I like Anthony Edwards because he's gotten better at that literally every year. Let's go through field goal percentages year after year. Rookie year, 41.7. Then we got 44-1, 45-9, 46-7. You see the same trend with threes. 32-9, 35-7, 36-9, 37-1. This guy's gotten better every year in the league. Uh, jumps out of the freaking gym. I love Anthony Edwards. I think we're on the same page there. He's so, 22 uh, years old. He's 22, 22 years old. Two. Yeah. So, so, I, you know, like, I see LeBron James and Michael Jordan in his game. I just do. I just flat out do. And I see he's cool as a cucumber, man. Like, he is just nothing phases this dude. And so, I mean, I think I think he's played through injuries. Uh, knock on wood, he's he's generally stayed healthy. He's only 22. <laughs> he's a freak athlete. He does it all. So it's fine. I mean, I think a lot of, like, Michael Jordan and LeBron James had very inconsistent jumpers <laughs> when they were 22. Um, and I, yes, I am comparing him to, the, to, to them. I really am. I think, I mean, I think, um, I'm not an NBA scout, but I've seen enough basketball to know when somebody sticks out. And I've said it for the last two plus years, this dude just sticks out and it's, it's starting to, it's, it, he's, he's just starting to scratch the surface of what he's capable of. So I am a big time believer in Ant-Man. Like he is, he is my number one overall basketball player. He has been for a while and he will continue to be. And I've even debated, do I go in and snipe some of my one-on-one -on -one people on some of those uh, 2020 Prism Silver PSA 10s Ant-Man, but I've left them, I've left them for the nooffseason.com fam to buy. Um, I haven't, I haven't gone in and, and sniped our own peeps, but he, it, this has been, that has been the card where I've wanted to several times so if you're holding that card i think you're in good shape totally agree it's a win 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 no matter what your positioning is you just need to know where your positioning is so you know what to do with the card like paul said depending on where you got in and when you need to get out things like that all right someone that isn't the face of their own league is going to be uh the flyer play that i'm bringing up to you guys next um i ran a across an interesting video uh the other day on social media and it kind of triggered um different responses for me in terms of wanting to find information as to if it could be a good investment. So um, it's very rare that we discuss buying any players based on hopefulness of performance spikes, especially short term. Uh, but today I'm going to bring a fun and cheap option to the table for those of you that enjoy investing in players uh, that have low entry points and high upside. And of course, uh, I do have interesting data to support why I think that this player might have a breakout season. Um, of course, as well, I do want to clarify, this is not a sports card strategy. Uh, more so a fun option based on trends that I am pointing out. Also, for transparency purposes, like I mentioned, I'd like to note I heard a large portion of the debate somewhere on the Internet, but I can't figure out what the exact source was. I wish I could cite my source in here. I do know the general discussion came from a former backup quarterback in the NFL. I just can't remember his name or find his social media. I uh, just want to put that out there before I hop into this. But my flyer play today, Paul, and hear me out, is Sam Darnold. And you guys are probably hearing that thinking, what in the world am I listening to right now? I know. I get it. He's been awful since joining the league. Hasn't lived up to the expectations. But let's just do a small recap of Sam Darnold's timeline. Third overall pick in the 2018 draft uh, by the New York Jets at 20 years old. Uh, kind of struggled for three years over there. And then saw two years of action for the Carolina Panthers where he continued to underperform. Uh, last year was on the 49ers roster. Saw very little action, but did play well when he was on the field. Uh, and more importantly, Paul got to learn in a fast-paced offense with good coaching and got to be around a winning organization there. Uh, with the Vikings parting ways uh, with Kirk Cousins, Sam Darnold is currently QB1 over there right now, meaning he gets to throw to Justin Jefferson himself uh, and Jordan Addison. Uh, this is prior to the draft that he's QB1, obviously. Who knows if things could change there? Um, so let's talk about case study. Why do I think this could be a good year for Sam Darnold? He's been, like I said, below average since joining the league. Paul, I hate to do it to you, but I got to talk Aaron Rodgers. Uh, so Sam Darnold was 20 when he got drafted. Aaron Rodgers was 21. Didn't really see the field for three years. Got to learn for three plus years uh, and was nearly 25 years old by the time he got the reins. Darnold, 20 years old when he gets drafted. Just now 26, even though he's been in the league for seven years. Uh, spent a year learning under fantastic offense and coaching staff is about to start on a decent team for the first time. And like I mentioned, has those fantastic options at wideout. This could be a good year for him, and he's cheap even though he's kind of up lately. His 2018 off to downtown PSA 10 rookie is up 24% over the last 90 days across 11 trades. 
This is the card to buy. I think, Paul, if you're buying Sam Darnold, last sale, 250 bucks, pop count 128. I think this card could 2x if Darnold and the Vikings start off hot and Jettas comes back streaking down the field making plays. I think this is an interesting flyer play, Paul. I'm curious to get your feedback and what you think. This is a super cheap rookie optic PSA 10 downtown. I like it. I like I like it for that reason alone. And anytime you can get a starting QB in the NFL, even if he's only a starter on paper currently, because we don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming NFL draft, we think the Vikings might draft, you know, JJ McCarthy or somebody. Uh, to fill that, you know, fill that QB one slot there. Um, that would be the only, the only concern. I mean, th- other than that, I think it's a great case to buy Sam Darnold. I was wondering if if our guy Gary V was gonna pop into the show for a second because I know he's got a ridiculous amount of Sam Darnold cards that he's probably looking to unload at some point. And the whole crew over there at Vayner Media, I think, probably has a ridiculous amount of Sam Darnold cards as well as as Jets fans, but. Um, I like it, Connor. I mean, you called it a mega flyer QB. Under that pretense, it's a great call. It's a great call. I know Lefty McKee on the Lefty Card Show has this thing called Reserve Driver, right? Where you get to like reserve a flyer. And this is a great reserve driver pick for the for lefty car for lefty cards, right? So I like it. I like it. Two hundred and fifty dollars. I definitely could two x if he's and did. I don't know if you already said this, but he did start off hot as the Panthers starter a couple years ago. They started three and zero, right? So it's possible that history repeats him. It repeats itself um, in Minnesota, where even if they draft a QB, look, if they draft a QB, Darnold's prices could stay low, making him even more of a great mega flyer play. And then you absolutely sell all of your Darnold stuff. If the Vikings win in week one, I mean, that thing, and Darnold's the starting QB. Look, if Darnold gets named the starter in the preseason over whoever they draft or whoever else they acquire, because we know they're going to get somebody else. They're not just going to roll into 2024 with Darnold, and the other two guys that they got on the roster from last year, uh, you know, Cousins is gone, obviously, but his two backups are still there. They're not going to go in with those three players. They're going to acquire either a first or second round pick or bring in somebody to compete with Darnold. So when he gets named the starter, that's a good selling marker. When he is in the news competing for a starting job, if he's not named the starter, that's a good selling marker. If he does start in week one and actually wins, that's probably the selling marker. So I actually really like this. For $250, that's actually, well, again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to go from that two to $300 up to 1000 This could be a way to do it. Interested to see what the audience thinks. Let us know in a comment below at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. Uh, love it, man. Um, I might go, I might go searching for this actually. Can you, can you get one right now? The last sales 250, but what's available? That's the other side of this. I ask, uh, rhetorically there. You don't actually have to answer, but, uh, definitely interested in the audience's take on this. I, I think it's well done, Connor invest or fade. I say maybe go in, maybe go into this Darnold, you know, and, and I think another guy just kind of in the same ilk, right? That, I, I haven't really talked that much about. I mentioned his name Monday real quick, but Lefty on Lefty Cards and Chase Krim on Monday talked about him. Gardner Minshew, that's Lefty's guy. So Gardner Minshew could be another one kind of in the exact same situation as Darnold. Um, doesn't have the same background, but in, in, in kind of the exact same situation. Like, is he the starter? Are they going to bring in somebody else? Like that kind of a situation. So I think there's a ton of opportunities with NFL quarterbacks right now. I think that's where everyone's focus actually should be for these next couple of weeks. And uh, props for bringing up Darnold. Gary V, are you coming in? Is Gary coming into the show today? He's been on the show before. I don't know if he's popping in or not. Stay tuned. But Connor bringing up Sam Darnold. Love it. And guys, I'd be amiss here to to not clarify that I'm not trying to say that Sam Darnold is the next Aaron Rodgers, even though Paul hates his guts. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers is a uh, first ballot Hall of Famers had an unbelievable career. What I am saying is that uh, the, t- the time that he's had sitting in a, in a top organization the past year is likely an area of development. 
And this guy's only 26. It feels like he's been in the league a decade. He has been in seven years, but he's still young. So just want to clarify, I'm not trying to compare him directly to Aaron Rodgers. Just saying the, the trends are there that he's had some time to learn. So hopefully uh, that's the move. I got the green light from Paul Hickey. We'll see how things pan out there. And of course, we'll be sure to keep you guys posted. Paul, like you mentioned, you got to be able to find the cards on eBay, right? That's that's what has to happen at the end of the day. Uh, and speaking of eBay, you have a fantastic eBay tip uh, that kind of spawned out of our Jackson Cheerio cell alert. You texted me the other night and we're like, do I need to do this? And we were like, yeah. And it was a great breakdown for you and a great decision. So, uh, of course, we want to get the audience tuned in on what we're doing. Little tips, big tips, keep them up to date to help them make profits, too. So what you got for us? All right. Yesterday, we sent out a Jackson Cheerio sell alert, and it was pretty straightforward. You know, the, the intricacies were basically that Jackson Cheerio, yesterday it was announced, would be the Brewers' opening day center fielder. And that is the call-up, essentially. And we always say sell at the call-up. And then when we look at the calendar yesterday, which was March 19th, Connor's birthday, we, we counted out what's what's 10 days away. Well, 10 days away is opening day, March 28th, Brewers opening day. So we thought, wait a minute, this is a perfect, we always talk about what is a marker where there's interest at the beginning of an auction and a marker where there's interest at the end of the auction. The reason I really like the seven to 10 day for many sports, for most sports, is because typically you'll get a selling marker that coincides with something else that's happening relevant to that player about a week later. In this case, it's the perfect timing for Jackson Churio because we have the call-up and then we have opening day, which will be his debut. And so there will be a lot of people out there that will debate, well, should we wait until the debut to start the auction or should we start the auction now? And so I thought, okay, let's go ahead and send out the sell alert, regardless of Jackson Churio cards, regardless of where you bought in and all that stuff. Now should be the time over the next 10 days where his pricing does move up to the point where you're glad that you moved out of it. Now, we also say in the sell alert that we know that if he does perform ridiculously well, the card could continue to go up, but chances are... Uh, those scenarios are few and far between. So chances are this is going to be the best selling marker to move out of the card and move back in later if you, if you really like Jackson Cheerio. But you get to decide what to do with those profits. Now, what's interesting is that his Bowman Chrome First Auto PSA 10 has been selling for between $750 and $1,000 over the last 30 days. So I listed mine uh, with an opening bid of $399. And I already have that bid, by the way. One day into the auction, I already have, I already have that opening bid. And I'm $500 into that cart. So I felt very confident that I would get, you know, probably $800 to $1,000, even if nothing really spectacular happens in Jackson Cheerio's debut. In a 10-day auction, I'm going to do really well on that card. And what's interesting, though, is as I was on eBay yesterday, in the afternoon, we had already sent out the sell alert. And most of my curiosity was around what's happening with that particular card, that base auto PSA 10 out of 2022 Bowman. And what I found is that there's not many, there were not many that were listed, but there was one that I found that was listed for a buy it now no best offer option, but a buy it now at $749.99. And I thought, someone's going to buy that card now, and then there's going to be that comp, which is a little bit lower than the most recent comp. Then I realized immediately that that card is in the eBay vault. And a light bulb went off. Because normally, there's no way in hell that I would buy a card after immediately sending out a sell alert, right? That's just counterintuitive. I don't do that. I don't pump and dump. Like I literally do the opposite of a pump and dump all the time. I'm always telling people to sell and I'm selling. I'm not telling people to buy and selling. But in this case, because the card was in the eBay vault, what that means for me, because I have an eBay vault, is that if I buy that card, I immediately take possession of that card. Immediately, meaning I can immediately list it for sale. 
So in theory, I can buy a Jackson Cheerio card for a price that I probably honestly would have paid for it six months ago in prime buying season for it. And I can list it now. So what's the difference between buying it now and buying it six months ago if it's for the same price? So my thought is there's going to be a comp on this card like in the next few days of $749.99. Because it's in the eBay vault, I can immediately buy it and list it. I want this to be my comp. I don't like the comp for my card, by the way. Like it, that comp doesn't help my card that I have listed right now. But if I can buy that card and list it, I like the card. Now I've all of a sudden, now all of a sudden I'm back to selling it during a sell alert. So that's what I did, Connor. I said, look, I can take position, possession of this card right now. It's literally only $749.99 because there are no fees. In addition to that, there is no best offer option. So I'm just going to buy it because there were 13 people and the number of watchers were going up. The longer I watched it, it went from 11 to 12 to 13. So I just went ahead and bought it and listed it right away for $999. So now I've got an auction uh, with one bid at $399 of that card. And now I've got a second copy of that card in PSA 10 in a buy it now scenario for $999. And my plan is to do a little bit of comparison and then report back to the nooffseason.com fam in a future episode. If that doesn't sell for $999 by opening day, I'm going to take it down and list it on opening day. Then I'm going to be able to tell everybody What's better, listing at the call-up leading up to opening day or listing on opening day? So that's my entire like weird Jackson Churio Bowman Chrome base auto PSA 10 scenario from yesterday. Only possible, everybody. I can't underscore this enough. Only possible because of the eBay vault to immediately take possession of the card because if you think about it, if this would have had to ship to me, it would have had to go through the eBay authentication program. And I wouldn't have received this card for a couple of weeks, which would be past the selling marker, which is typically why this is not something we ever talk about, but possible because I just did it yesterday. Connor, I know we wanted to talk about it on today's show. What's your breakdown as we let this kind of sink in for the audience? Yeah, I mean, I just love that we're like, I feel like we're 24 seven looking for ways to get better. Like it's like I'm in high school, like trying to grind to make a basketball team or something. Like we're always looking for ways to improve. And this was a great conversation, a great point that I thought you, that you, that you made here. And I kind of equated to Paul, like if you see a nice area that's gentrifying and the, the people that are buying out the areas of places that don't look as nice because they don't want it to devalue their stuff that does look nice that they're putting up. Right. So that's essentially what you were able to do right here. Obviously not everyone has the cash flow to just go out and do this. But if you are in a scenario where, you can eliminate your competition that's undervaluing a print that you think is going to be worth more by the time your auction ends and ultimately could uh, undervalue your own auction and you can have the ability to get rid of it. I think it's a great play here. Um, it's probably something that we need to look forward to doing more when we're listing cards, looking at other comps to make sure that those cards aren't killing the values uh, when we have these auctions out for sell markers. Yeah, and what's the competition look like too? You know, it's like, it didn't look good for my card. That was the other part of it is like, it's kind of like, I got to take this off the market <laughs> because it doesn't look good to have an opening bid listed at $399 and a card available for $749. So just even getting it off the market was one thing. Owning it was another thing. Knowing that there was going to be a comp anyway was a third thing. But the main thing was the fact that I could immediately take possession of it and list it. It's It was immediately in my eBay vault upon that purchase. So I could immediately go and click create listing off of that eBay vault. So I do think that's a good tip. I do think that that's something that everybody needs to look out for. And, you know, this was less about me doing it and it's more about sharing experience with the audience and the nooffseason.com fam to just, to your point, become better at this, right? There's just, I love, I've been doing, this is my fourth year doing this and I'm learning something new literally every day, um, which is why there's no way I'm stopping doing this anytime soon. So 
I'm excited for what's going to happen in the next 10 days with all of our Cheerio auctions. I want the fam to keep us updated. Let us know how your Cheerio auctions are going. And obviously stay tuned for other sell alerts and things like that. I know um, Frank Cosman's talking about Jackson Merrill in the live chat. We'll get, we'll get to that at the end of the show in the audience QA. So that's another one. There's going to be more Jackson Holiday. Uh, stay tuned for that one when that one comes. But uh, excited to see what else you're cooking up here on today's episode for us, Connor. We got we got a lot more great stuff coming up right now. We do indeed, and I want to give a, some live chat love real quick. Ziggy No in the house got Card Snatcher, got Fern, uh, Boudini's Cards and Comics, Alan Ma. Uh, shout out to Gabe Davis for being in the house. Said Jackson Cheerios name sounds like a flavor of sunflower seeds. That one gave me a good chuckle. Like you mentioned, uh, Co's in the house, Cause in the house. I think Color Match Collect guys. Thanks for being here, of course. Uh, next segment that we're hopping into is going to be called the bundle builder uh, might sound familiar because it is a iteration of our 1k budget builder. So typically the 1k budget builder is where myself and Paul, uh, whoever used to be lefty, uh, we break it down. We get a low end, a mid tier and a high end card. Uh, essentially it equals a thousand dollars. And the plan is to beat each other in terms of finding a card that can increase in value over X amount of time. Uh, today we're going to mix it up just a little bit. It's going to be a bundle builder. So what I've done is I've built two bundles that have low-end, mid-tier, and high-end cards. Uh, they aren't necessarily the cards that I think are the best possible investments for the for the uh, tier that they're in, but I think that's the exciting part, right? Paul has to kind of weigh the pros and cons of each bundle. If there's a card that he really likes in the bundle and there's a card that he doesn't like, you know, what's going to take the cake here? So let's hop into my picks uh, for today and see which direction Paul goes in. Um, bundle number one is going to be the QB pack, so they do have themes. QB pack. So low-end card is going to be CJ Stroud, 2023 Don Russ base in PSA 10. Uh, this card's down 32% over the last 30 days. The last sale was less than 70 bucks. Uh, this is a card that was going well above $100 all season, of course. Uh, 183 sales over the last 30 days. So super liquid card uh, and not something that you'd have to be concerned about getting moved when the time comes. Mid-tier is going to be Tua Tagovailoa, Optic Hollow, PSA 10, his rookie card there. Uh, Paul, I know this is a card that you're big on. Uh, this is something we talk about with our one-on-one -on -one clients. Down 14% over the last 14 days uh, across six sales. Pop count 1,500, so pretty accessible. Last sale, $133. 14-day average cost, 137 so pretty similar there. Uh, sold above $200 all of September and all of October in 2023. Uh, so I think this is a pretty solid opportunity for investment here. And then the high-end card. Uh, right card. Potentially right player, Paul. Curious to see your feedback here. And if this deters you from going with this bundle, Justin Fields, 2021 Optic Downtown PSA 10. Now, obviously, Justin Fields moved to the Steelers and reportedly won't even compete for the starting job against another addition being Russell Wilson. So not exactly the marker we were expecting uh, for Justin Fields when we were telling you guys to load up on him. But, Paul, you discussed a little bit last episode that there is some hope to profit off Fields still. So we can go into that a little bit. Uh, for those of you that weren't able to catch the show on Monday, uh, this card, his 2021 Optic Downtown and PSA 10, is down 13% over the last 30 days. That's 12 trades uh, and last sale, 740 bucks. So essentially, Paul, uh, right around $1,000 still for these three cards. Uh, interesting upside, but we'll hop into our second bundle and see what you think. Uh, this is going to be the Hoops bundle, of course. I got to include some basketball. You guys know me. Tyrese Halliburton, his 2020 Prism base in PSA 10 is down 38% over the last 30 days. That's 35 sales tracked. Uh, last sale, just 37 bucks. Paul, it seems like uh, with Anthony Edwards emerging, the Thunder holding things down, it seems like Halliburton and the Pacers are going to take a backseat uh, to the Timberwolves and Oklahoma City Thunder in regards to emerging teams in the NBA, these young teams that we're talking about and his car prices uh, are suffering accordingly. Mid-tier, Brennan Miller, 2023 Prism Silver PSA 10. You guys know we love the Prism Silvers. Uh, Miller is cooling down from what was an elite rookie scoring streak a couple of years ago, showing everyone why he was a top pick in the NBA draft. He seems to be a legit full-package player, six foot seven, versatile, athletic, smooth jumper. You guys know what I'm going to say. Scores at all three levels. This card is down 37% over the last 30 days, tracked across 16 sales. This one's a little gimmicky, though, Paul. So I mentioned down 36.5%, but the last two sales that are 227 bucks are far below previous pricing, which is above $300. So maybe this card isn't overly discounted, and those are kind of anomaly sales, which is a good discussion point, Paul, because 
while we do try to avoid using data from outlier sales uh, to make an argument for a card necessarily being discounted, how much do those two comps give you the ability to buy the card at a cheaper price closer to that lower $300 mark? Um, and then for your high-end card here, I'm going with Trey Young, his 2018 Contenders Rookie Ticket Auto Ball at Waste. That's number 142 in PSA 10, uh, despite Trey Young putting up another great year of spectacular numbers. Seems like he averages a 25-plus point double-double with assists every year. The Hawks just can't win. Will they Will they eventually move Trey Young to a contender? What are they going to do? Will they blow it up? Paul, what are Trey Young sell markers? This card's down big, down 52% the last 60 days. The last three sales in order are $921. 853 bucks and 734 dollars there curious to see what you got here for me paul in terms of feedback uh, i think these two options stack up pretty well against one, one one another and uh some interesting cards here yeah i mean first i want to say this i challenge anybody out there to find just a better overall sports podcast than this show and, and I'm saying sports podcast, not even just sports card podcast. But I mean, this is phenomenal content. And so props to you, Connor. Like, this is super fun. Um, there's a lot of great content out there in the hobby, and there's a lot of great content out there in the world. But to me, this is like the pinnacle. This is like segments like this where you've bundled together cards from a low-end, mid-tier, and high-end from two different sports. Both very relevant bundles. I'm going to break down why I think that this is such a great segment. And then I'm going to tell you the bundle that I pick and why I pick it. First of all, um, the nooffseason.com fam is very passionate and I'm very grateful for that. And, and recently we've had people asking, can you do some more low end recommendations? Because not all of us have several hundred dollars per card. And yes, 100%. So the Tyrese Halliburton 2020 Prism Base PSA 10, that where the last sale was under $40. In my mind, that's a great starter card situation to be in because Tyrese Halliburton, for all, you know, for all of what we've seen this season and leading up to this season, Everyone that I've talked to and heard from about Tyrese Halliburton, there seems to be a bit of a consensus that he is like the guy. Okay, so that's not necessarily the right card, but it is a flagship card, Prism, and it is a PSA 10, and so there are desirable things about that card. He's the right player. It is the right time. It is a PSA 10. So you could make a case that that is the right low-end card for Tyrese Halliburton. So everybody, there you go. Phenomenal recommendation from Connor Barnett. Um, he's throwing it out there as something to, you know, somewhat of a recommendation. I'm validating that that is a good buy right now. Down 38% in the last 30 days. Super liquid card. The reason that's a good buy, everybody, is because you are going to be able to sell that card worst case scenario for within a few dollars of what you paid for it. And there's nowhere else in the world that you can go. You can't go to a golf course. You can't go to a bowling alley. You can't go to a movie. You can't go on a family vacation. You can't go to a theme park and get paid for having fun at those places. You can't pay the entry fee, pay the greens fee, pay the whatever play the round, take the roller coaster ride, whatever the F, and then all of a sudden, three months later, somebody pays you the same amount of money for that. That's what we're talking about here. You get the enjoyment of buying the Tyrese Halliburton card. You're going to get that money back. And oh, by the way, you might make some money. So low-end recommendation, love it. Okay, now to the bundles. There's so much to unpack with this bundle number one because... The overlying theme is that right now, literally this week and next week, and probably the following week, and I'll explain why in a second, are the best times to go all the F in on NFL starting quarterbacks. And even some potential you know, backups that could be starters like Justin Fields. And the reason why is because 
everyone's attention is going to be on March Madness. Everyone's attention is going to be on baseball opening day. And everyone's attention has just come off of NFL free agency because it's a short news cycle. And the NFL draft hype cycle hasn't started yet. So now is your buying three-week window because everyone's attention is elsewhere. And this is one of the only times a year where buying NFL QBs is going where they ain't. Because as we all know, buying NFL QBs is what's going to make you the most money flipping sports cards. So I am easily picking bundle number one. Like it's not even close. It's not even close. And not because bundle number two isn't a good bundle. It's because this time of year is the time to go get these quarterbacks. And it's not because of the CJ Stroud and it's not because of the Justin Fields. It's because of the Tua. That Tua card is probably one of the top cards that I would recommend anybody going and buying right now. That Tua Optic Hollow PSA 10. To get it for less than $150, you are printing money. You are printing money because you're selling it week one of the NFL season, maybe even week two or three, but then you're getting rid of it because that Dolphins offense is explosive. You're not going to wait till Tua gets hurt. You're not going to, you know, you're basically going to sell it upon the hype, the hype rise of the NFL season. Maybe you hold it through week one to see if the Dolphins put up, you know, anywhere close to 70 points again, even 40, 50 points. Like that card is easily a $250 card. It just easily is a $250 card just on the hype rise of the NFL season. So, you could make money on the Stroud. I'm not so sure about that one because it's a base Donruss PSA 10. My gut tells me that goes down to as low as 45, then maybe comes back up to peak around 80 in August or early September. The Justin Fields, I actually really like as well. That's probably my second favorite card on the entire six cards that you put together. Two is number one. Justin Fields is number two because that is the right card. Optic, downtown, PSA 10, rookie, Steelers. I think it's BS that he's not going to be the starter personally. I don't have any kind of inside sources there. But I just, I don't see Russell Wilson doing anything. And even if even if Russell Wilson is the starter for the first three or four weeks, he's going to get yanked. And Justin Fields is going to be the starter. And there's going to be hyper... Justin Fields is a darn good football player. I mean, let's be honest. And the Steelers are a phenomenal organization. So I think this is a great... I agree that like this isn't what we thought. This isn't what we thought was going to happen. So you could say we were wrong about the Justin Fields selling marker. This isn't the selling marker. But that doesn't mean that we're wrong in the fact that you could still sell him now in September. Because... When he is eventually named the Steelers starting quarterback, and I do believe it'll be sometime in 2024, I think this is an example of a card that's going to that's gonna go up and you're going to make money on it. And I know that $743 is a lot of money, but let's put it into perspective for a second. If you're buying raw cards and you're grading them at PSA in a $19 bulk submission for 20 cards, I've started to say this more and more. Your minimum entry fee is $550 for that entire submission. That's just your cost to grade the cards. That doesn't, in, that doesn't include what you paid for those cards. And what you paid for some of those cards is going to be quite a bit of money. So if you're coming to me and you're saying, Paul, we need more budget-friendly options, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to give you budget-friendly options. But then I'm also going to challenge you a little bit and say, hey, everybody, $743 for a PSA 10 of Justin Fields rookie optic downtown. That's a budget friendly option because it's just about $200 above what you're paying only for PSA to grade your cards, which, oh, by the way, you're not going to get all tens. So that's a budget. That's a high end option, but that's pretty budget friendly. Well done, Connor. I'm taking bundle number one far and away, but that doesn't discredit the content that you put together here because bundle number two is a legitimate bundle. You've got the Tyrese Halliburton 
You've got Brandon Miller, who's an up and coming. You know, he's playing very well. Prism Silver PSA 10 is the right card. I don't love Trey Young, but this is still a contender's rookie ticket auto variation PSA 10. So it's still a great card. And let's talk real quick about the discussion point of outlier sales. Cause I think you brought up something in there that is worth discussing as well. The outlier sales do matter, right? So I think it's, it's wise of us to say that they're outlier sales and to qualify that for the audience to say, look, this doesn't mean that this card is necessarily worth this because essentially the average over the last 30 days or the average over the last however many days is quite higher than that or lower than that, depending on the scenario. But you're absolutely right. These comps matter, even though they're quote unquote outliers, they always matter. Comps always matter. If you tell me that every comp doesn't matter, then I would argue that you, you've you never been to a card show and you've never negotiated with people at a card show. People at card shows are using every single freaking comp. And by the way, you better check everyone's ass at card shows too. Where'd you see that comp? How long ago was that comp? Oh, it's not liquid. That's because it's a pop five. You know what I mean? So you just have to know your data. You have to know your situation. You have to know, yes, they're outlier sales, but they matter in real life at card shows. They matter in discussions on discords and Facebook groups. And they matter when you're bidding on eBay because the smart eBay buyer that listens to this show will look at recent comps and they're going to put their maximum bid closer to the lowest recent comp. So I think that it's a great, it's great that you brought that up as a discussion point underneath the Brandon Miller card because it's definitely relevant. Every comp matters. Even if the card wasn't even paid for, if it shows up as a comp somewhere, there's still context around that that needs to be discussed. It's it, 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 The good data tools will clean those out. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't be cleaned out, but I'm saying that they do matter contextually in the big discussion of trying to negotiate for these cards. Totally agree. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned card shows, Paul, because that was my initial thought when I when I put down this conversation point in our notes here. It's like any kid that sees this, any of those 12 year old kids that we see running around card shows with several thousand you mean dollars. The savages? The, the absolute savages out there that are just finessing and yosting everyone. Um, those kids will use the frick out of both of those comps for Brandon Miller, and they're not going to pay anywhere near what everyone else is paying on eBay because of those comps. So I'm on the exact same page. Is the card necessarily worth what the comps say? Probably not. Is the card going to help you as a buyer get the card for cheaper? 1,000% it is. And it's really nice that in this scenario, it's actually two sales. It's not just one. So well put, Paul. I'm on the exact same page with you there. It's like a tool to use, right? It's, if you find them, you need to be aware of them and you need to make sure that you don't think that that means that's what that card is worth. But it is a tool to come down from what the card really is worth. You need to do your research and find out where the where the valuation truly is for that print. So great work there, Paul. I'm on the exact same page as you. Connor, before we jump into the audience QA here, uh, shout out to Perk. Um, breaking news. Breaking news that just hit the PR news wire. When we spoke to Andy Broom, VP of cards at CGC Cards, we aired that interview last week. I thought it was a great interview. A lot of value in there just for hobbyists. Like not even, you know, if you don't have, if you have zero interest in CGC cards, Andy Broom is a great hobbyist. It's still a, a great interview. And one of the things he mentioned when Andy Kaysen from Football Card Quest asked him about autograph authentication. He said, do you guys authenticate autographs or are there plans for that? I didn't put two and two together, but in that interview, Andy Broom also mentioned that there was a big announcement that he wishes he could have talked to us about in that interview, but that maybe he'll come talk to us on the show later about. I think this breaking news could be, could be, what maybe he was referring to, Certified Collectibles Group, CCG, who owns CGC Cards, is set to acquire JSA authentication. Those of you who know JSA may not know it. As, it's, it's James Spence authentication. If you don't know JSA or James Spence authentication, they are one of the top 
most legitimate autograph authentication companies. So they will authenticate autographs beyond just autographs on sports cards. They'll authenticate autographs of really any kind of memorabilia, even outside of sports. That's my understanding of the reputation, just the reputation of JSA has made it made itself into my brain somehow um, as, as one of the most legitimate autograph authentication companies out there. And there were, there were pro probably some people would, would counterpoint me on that, but it is a very reputable company. I can say that with confidence. And up until this point, uh, CGC cards does not authenticate autographs, meaning when you send a non-pack pulled autograph into CGC cards, they do they have not had the capability like PSA does and like um, some other grading companies have. I know Beckett uh, will authenticate the autograph, grade the autograph if you pay for that service as well, and grade the card if you pay for that service as well. So we don't know what CGC's plans are. We 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 haven't been told anything other than just what Perk put in the live chat here. And now I'm I'm pulling it up. It looks like it just the the press release just hit the newswire um, during the show that uh, Certified Collectibles Group will acquire uh, JSA authentication. So that's pretty cool, I think. I think it's notable. And thanks to Perk for throwing it out there. Um, so we can, we can yeah, Barry Sif, we talked about this. Barry Sif said, I had JSA authenticate a Wemby auto I got at the draft. It's not a card, but it's a dinner menu. This was at the uh, June... Uh, 2023 NBA draft where Victor Wembanyama. I mean, Barry Siff's everywhere. Like he's at the he's at the Super Bowl. He's at the NBA draft. He's doing something for the Final Four. I mean, Barry Siff's just everywhere. He's the man. So um, they did it in an hour at the Arizona Card Show. They authenticated the Wemby Auto. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So they authenticated a dinner menu. I know Barry had the had a photo of himself and Wemby. I think with the dinner menu. So pretty cool stuff there. Thanks for sharing, Barry. Appreciate that. Um, all right, Connor, let's, let's uh, go through the live chat. There's some, there's some um, insights in the live chat love. And then there's some questions so we can go through them. Yeah, real quick. Thanks for the freaking support today, guys. We've been holding 60 viewers for like the past hour, which is amazing from you guys across platforms. So appreciate the love from y'all. We're going to get to as many of these as we possibly can. If, for whatever reason we happen to run out of time, but we don't get to your question or we didn't see it. Um, go sign up for a free trial at nooffseason.com, free 30 day trial. You can get that free premium membership for a full month uh, where we have the overflow show. So if your questions are answered here, you get a month to submit them at the overflow show via nooffseason.com slash ask. Every Friday, myself and Paul uh, will air that episode for you where we talk about your questions, get them answered from you or for you, excuse me, uh, and help you build that ideal investment sports card portfolio. All right. Let's hop into it, Paul. Starting off with Mad Card 72 over on Twitch says thoughts on Brady PSA 10 refractors. Paul, I'm assuming that's Tom Brady, uh, unless your head's in a different spot. It's Brady House because um, Mad Card 72 put House in the next comment. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad he did because, yeah, I, I definitely would have been lost on that. Um, so I've looked up Brady House and his first Bowman was in Bowman Draft. 2021 and he has autos that are in uh 2022 bowman and i'm struggling to find first autos so there there are some cases and i i do not know if this is one of them or not but there are some cases where prospects do not have first prospect autos and this could be one of them. I could be wrong, but I'm finding autos, like refractor autos uh, out of 2022 Bowman Chrome. But I'm finding first prospect cards out of 2021 Bowman draft. So Brady House uh, is the currently the 48th overall prospect on the MLB Top 100. He's a third baseman in the Washington Nationals organization. And... He his expected uh, arrival time in the MLB is 2025. He's only 20 years old, currently in Double A, six foot four. Um, he was the 11th overall pick in 2021, so definitely some draft capital there. I feel like 
I, like I, I don't, I can't say confidently mad cards as to whether or not like I would flag plant as like, you have to go buy Brady house for a couple of reasons. Like for me personally, and for everyone that I advise at nooffseason.com and anyone in the one-on-one -on -one package, like I would say an expected time of arrival of 2025 is like too far away for me as a selling marker. Um, I know the baseball prospector, like the Craig's cards, 11s of the world and the lefty McKees of the world, and maybe even the chase crims of the world. Cause I know he's big into baseball prospecting also. I know those guys would all, there'd be a contingent that would be like, well, you know, it, it, it's a good time to go where they ain't with him kind of a thing. Cause he's got the draft capital and he's a six foot four third baseman. And, and so and his, his, his prices are like he's cheap for a PSA 10 auto uh, out of 2022 Bowman. It's not his first. It's around $100. Like it's between $100 and $125. So there's upside there if you can wait till the call up. Now his uh, first PSA 10 refractor out of 2021 Bowman draft is only it's less than $40. So, and that's a pretty liquid card. So if, if, you know, a lot of times the refractor PSA 10 upon call up will also pop. So if you can, if you can do it, if you can wait, and here's another one, the Bowman draft Sapphire out of 2021 Bowman Sapphire is on, it's less than $55 in PSA 10. So those are three cards right there. Um, outside of the refract, I think the refractor auto that you might be referring to mad card 72, um, could be buys for Brady House. I'm not the guy to say buy Brady House, mainly for the reason of it's for me, it's got to be like a top five prospect with an expected time of arrival in the MLB of the current season. Um, that's that's what I am going to advise people to do. That doesn't mean that you would be wrong to look into Brady House or to buy Brady House or to consider Brady House, but um He's just, he's not going to make my cut because I'm just, there's too many other options for me in the sports card strategy, strategy sphere of investment options. Up next, we're going over to Frank K and Mad Cards 72. Thanks for the question as well. Uh, up next, Frank K. So earlier in the show, Paul, you were talking about picking up a Carson Beck uh, and the packaging was poorly packaged and it looks like it could have, I mean, it could have damaged the card really. You, you don't think you got any damage, which is fantastic, but uh, that was one of your basic tips. Frank K wants to know if you would still grade the Carson Beck. Uh, I'm assuming he's asking that question because of how the packaging was. Uh, but what do you got, Paul? Yeah, Frank K. Great question. I'm grading it. I mean, number one, because it looks like it could gem. And it, there's a couple like there's a couple corners where you can see just like a tad. Like I'm sure under the 10 times magnifier loop, you're gonna see some whitening on a couple of these corners. I think it's more realistically going to nine, but here's my deal. And I think that we all have to think this through when we talk about grading cards. When you buy a card, what's your end goal? Is your end goal to grade the card or is it to see if the card's gradable when you get it and then potentially not grade the card? Because I would argue that the latter could be detrimental to your sports card strategy and your overall way of making profit. The reason why is in the numbers. You got to have 20 cards to submit to PSA at $19 a card to get the $19 a card deal. So if you're all of a sudden weeding out all these cards because of eh, this centering or oh, this corner or this surface, look, I get it because you might have other cards that are going to fit into the 20. But a lot of you are going to be buying cards specifically to be one of the 20 that you're grading. I'm more in that category than I am in weeding things out. So I typically tell people like 9.99999 times out of 10, I'm grading the card regardless of how it looks when I get it. Just because I want it slabbed by PSA, it's going to be easier to sell. It is what it is. If it's a seven, it's a freaking seven. I'm still going to move on from it. I hope it gets a 10. More often than not, it gets a nine, unfortunately, but more often than not, I still profit because I'm buying the right card for the right player at the right time. So in the grading game, you're going to be underwater on probably about 60% of them. And the 40% that you're overwater on are the tens that you 
only were able to grade at the cost that you graded them at because of all the other lower grades. And I just think those factors don't really get talked about as much as they should. In reality, we're grading all the cards that we buy raw. I mean, we just are. Like now, if you're at a card show, you can be a little bit more selective with that process. Most of us aren't at card shows all the time. We're on eBay. We're on other other places online, other marketplaces where we're buying cards. So it's a great question, but yeah, I'm grading the Carson Beck for sure. And do I think it could get a 10? Absolutely. Because a lot of times, and on Monday's show, I went through two grading reveals and both of those grading reveals, like all the nines I thought were going to be tens and almost all the tens I thought were going to be nines. So what the hell do I know? I mean, I'm, I'm buying the card to grade them. That's what I'm doing. Frank, thanks for the fantastic debate question that was kind of centered around uh, what would you give advice to a newcomer in the hobby? Uh, yeah. So real quick, I'm going to touch on some of the advice from our other listeners. Paul, feel free to jump in and comment on any of them as I roll through them. From Sports Card Lounge says, start small. Smaller purchases equal smaller losses. Of course, smaller profits. But experience is worth more than profits when you're starting out. Paul, I love this. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I think it's hard to start small because what happens is people get so excited. Like it happened to me. So I totally relate to the fact that like you've got all, you know, you, you either find your old collection and then you want to do something with it. And in that process, you realize that all these other cards are cool and they're selling for so much money and you want to buy in and social media makes it worse because there's all these people in the hobby that are posting breaks of these huge cards being pulled and they're they're posting data around like cards that are selling for a lot of money with without the context of like how you actually make money doing that. So I think sports cards sports card card lounge thank you for the uh for the advice there for everybody. I think you're absolutely right. Like start small and I said don't buy like my my advice would be like don't feel obligated to buy anything for like the first six to 12 months i think sports card lounge adding on to mine is perfect because it's like if when you do want to taste it small like the halliburton like that halliburton psa 10 that connor threw out there earlier in the show perfect example what's 40 bucks like 40 bucks is lunch these days so go Make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, buy the Halliburton, taste that. Love it, Sports Cards Lounge. Yeah, I think the key part for me there was experience is worth more than profits when starting out. I think that's the huge part. It's like find your niche, find what works for you, find which of our strategies you want to apply to your everyday flipping life. Hopefully a lot of them, but uh, love it, Sports Card Lounge. Thanks for the comment there. Christopher Bell says, know the different parallels of each set and buy number cards. Very Sif. My piece of advice is a variation of Paul's. Get educated even a little before you buy. Browse eBay, not Google. Uh, Mountain Lake Card says, good advice from us. Only uh, leverage the knowledge and experience of others. Hopefully that's what you guys are doing here on the show. Uh, that's kind of what I've done from Paul, Lefty, uh, the others that, that have allowed me to kind of learn and pick up so quickly from uh, where I left off from collecting in the hobby as a young one. But uh, Paul, anything to add in any of those comments? I mean, Christopher's was great. I think Cardboard Connection is a great resource for doing what Christopher Bell says. Know the difference between all the parallels and, and you know, parallels off of the base cards in each set. I mean, so Cardboard Connection is a great resource just, just to go to see the checklist and understand the ridiculous amount of parallels per set and things like that. And I know Ziggy knows really good at that stuff too. So shout out to Ziggy. Like he does a great job of, of breaking down what uh what the most lucrative wax would be based on those different things um andy Kaysen, our, our buddy at the football card quest um has set rankings for football cards so that's another great resource to you know he ranks the sets essentially based on the value which is something we should probably do at nooffseason.com at some point but um yeah great great stuff from the audience on that advice to to new people in the hobby love it Yep. Up next, we got Anthony McCauley. It says auction or buy it. Now, if you're an avid listener, you probably know what Paul's coming with here. But Paul, for those that are either new to the show or haven't caught it, what are your selling strategies? I'm assuming they're referring to selling strategies here. Do you like auctioning off cards, listing at buy it now? What's a quick rundown on when to use each? Okay. The rundown is this. 
you're buying a card only with a selling marker in mind ever. And your selling mark at your selling marker, you're going to list in a seven or 10 day auction. And we've talked earlier on in this episode, a little bit about the intricacies, intricacies of that related to the Jackson trio example. But that's not to say that before your selling marker, there's not an opportunity to list the same card earlier in a buy it now or best offer scenario. I'll give you a quick example from my life within the last 24 hours as well. Drake London, 2022 Kaboom rookie PSA 10. I bought for $400, I believe a month ago. It was in Paul's pickups on this very show. I love that card. I listed it after the Kirk Cousins Atlanta Falcons acquisition for $1,000 or best offer. It is a pop nine card, so I felt like I could do that. And it is well ahead of the selling marker that I had originally anticipated uh, before the Kirk Cousins acquisition. But there's more renewed interest in Drake London cards since that. And so I figured, what the hey, I'll list it. Because to Ziggy's point, also in the live chat, you got to keep that seasonal cash flow going. So I listed it and I accepted an offer. I had a minimum offer of 750, meaning anything under 750 would get auto declined and I wouldn't even have to deal with it. And so I accepted an offer of $750 after some negotiation back and forth with a couple of different people via eBay messaging and profited on that card a total after fees and everything and after the cost of the card, total net profit $240. So $240 off of buying a Drake London card a month ago, Feel pretty good about that. So Anthony, love seeing you in the live chat, my man. Thanks for being part of the nooffseason.com fam. That's real life examples of the overall strategy is to buy with the auction in mind, but to list earlier if there's an earlier selling marker with the buy it now or best offer and just see if you can replenish that cash flow because that's what you're trying to do anyway. So don't, as much as we talk about the selling marker, don't lose sight of the fact that you could sell earlier if you can get the money, do it. Well put. Yeah, up next, we got Alan Ma. Paul, if you sell a bit of vaulted card on eBay or PSA, can you get the card sent to the buyer directly? How do vaulted services work with eBay? There's a lot of different vaults. I've talked about the eBay vault on this show. The eBay vault typically will work very seamlessly when you buy a vault eligible card and at checkout, you tell eBay to put it directly into your vault. Um, also, when you sell a card from your vault, you can immediately have it shipped to the buyer and eBay is going to do that for you. Like that's what's brilliant about the eBay vault is that eBay has your card. All you have to do is like, it just automatically happens when you sell a vaulted card, they're going to ship it for you, provide the tracking number to you and the buyer and all of that. It's a little bit less straightforward when you have uh, the collector's vault. So PSA is owned by Collector's Universe. Collector's Universe has the Collector's Vault. So the PSA Vault is actually the Collector's Vault. And the problem with the Collector's Vault is that while when you submit cards to PSA, they give you the option to vault them for free in the Collector's Vault versus ship them back to you. The problem with that is because the, the caveat for vaulting them for free with the collector's vault after being graded by PSA is that they have to sit there for a certain amount of time before you can ship them anywhere. And then when you ship them, you do have to pay the fee really that you would have paid PSA anyway, just to ship them back to you in the first place. So I've made this mistake before just because I wanted to try to see what the collector's vault was. And so I ended up having to wait until these three different cards that I had vaulted with the collector's vault after being graded at PSA uh, went past the amount of time that they needed to sit in the collector's vault. Otherwise, they were going to charge me a ridiculous fee to get them out early. So for that reason, I have never vaulted a card with the collector's vault since that experience. I have vaulted cards with eBay, um, mainly because those are cards that I've purchased off of eBay. So rather than deal with the risk of shipping, 
I just put them in the eBay vault because I know I want to sell them that way anyway. And then I can one click list them and eBay will ship them for me. The PWCC vault is a good option for people who need to just have someone else store their cards, take really good photos of their cards and ship them anywhere. So I used the PWCC vault for about two years when I lived in Spain. And that's how I first got started flipping cards was uh, just building in those PWCC fees. And I would buy cards anywhere, anywhere online. And I, my default address was always my PWCC vault. And then whenever I was ready to list them, I'd list them on eBay. I'd take the photos from PWCC, use those as my eBay photos. When they sold on eBay or anywhere else, I could go into my PWCC account and fill out a form to have them ship wherever I needed them shipped to. Good stuff, Alan. Hopefully that helped answer your question. Up next, we got Frank K says, what about Jackson Merrill, Paul? I'm going to go ahead and take this one, P. Diddy. Uh, guys, just because I'm in the lab on Mondays doesn't mean I'm not listening. I was listening. Just a spoiler alert, Frank. Yes, Jackson Merrill is going to have a sell alert coming today. Uh, Kobe Mayo potentially is going to have one. I need to dive a little bit deeper there. So stay tuned for that as it won't be every card that I list. I will do a breakdown of the cards that have gone up and the cards that you should be listing. Um, but it's going to be a large majority of the stuff that we recommended pitching. So stay tuned for that there. And uh, thanks for the input, Frank. Uh, up next, we got, let's see here, back to Perk. It says, how do you feel about Bowman U Chrome basketball singles with NCAA tournament starting tomorrow? Sales have slowed down on them, even after lowering prices. Will the prices continue lowering, or should you wait until games get played? Paul, what's the play here? Okay, so I guess the play is that if you own if you own guys and 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 women that are in the tournaments, the men's and women's tournaments, you know, it so aka you've ripped Bowman U basketball boxes over the last couple of years because they've been pretty cheap to rip. So we typically don't say ripping wax as a sports card strategy. But I guess, you know, in this case, if you own a lot of these singles, chances are, I'm, I'm guessing, Perk, that you and others have, have ripped boxes, and that's cool. So you've got singles of people that, or maybe you've bought singles. Uh, that's fine, too. Either way, I think it's it's a case-by-case -case basis of, like, who's in the tournament? What team do they play for? Are they play? Are they a significant player or role player on their teams? If you can piece put those pieces together then this week, this weekend, like tomorrow through Sunday is a phenomenal time to get those cards listed in like seven day auctions. Uh, because again, you get the benefit. That's why I love the seven day auctions because you get the benefit of maybe two games, right? And so now uh, you also mitigate some risk by having them in an auction, being able to move off of them. So I think that's the general strategy. I will say one thing that I haven't had a chance to really talk to Connor about yet until now live on the show is I think that moving forward, we need to, he and I need to go into the lab and we need to figure out specifically, is there an actual NCAA tournament Bowman Chrome U basketball strategy for men's and women's basketball cards? Because, you know, we've seen Caitlin Clark's car, cards blow up that has nothing to do with March Madness that has to do with Caitlin Clark and her breaking all these records so that's great for her and her cards and people who have made money on her cards that's phenomenal but I think that diff separate of that we need to uncover like is there an actual strategy where you could go buy uh what's his name um Fletcher Lawyer from Purdue or so you know some some like some like role player who can pop up and hit a bunch of threes for one of the top teams and then like is he does he have a cheap bowman chrome u first auto that could pop if purdue doesn't get upset by the 16 seed this year you know what i mean like those i say that obviously like i'm being facetious but like if purdue goes to the final four i hope to god they don't i'm a michigan state fan but you see where i'm going with this i think we we need to figure out like is there something there for 2025 and rest assured you know, Connor's the guy to do it. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, we certainly will. I think Paul, the the thing to research is is does the hype leading up to the tournament create pricing spikes? Because I'm not gonna be I can tell you right now it's not gonna be a scenario where I'm willing to start an auction uh in the first round of the tournament and wait and see how a player does because of how volatile the results are. Let me look at the tournament last year. It was a preposterous outcome, all the teams that got knocked off. Um, so I think this scenario, and we will, like you're saying, we'll definitely find out because we're always looking for different ways to make money. The play here is, I think, 
potentially is is can you find big name guys at a discounted price prior to the tournament and will the hype of the tournament let you start an auction that ends on the first day of the tournament to get the reap uh, yeah. the benefits of pricing increases without having to take on any risk of them getting knocked out early absolutely i think that's it too because like it, it's going to be impossible it's going to be catching lightning in a bottle if you were to like you know buy a single of someone who's going to pop off into the tournament I mean, if you look, if you look retroactively at NCAA tournaments, which is probably something Connor's going to do in this analysis, like, is there has there ever been a scenario where where we we knew, like, we had any indication of any clue who who that team or that player was going to be, who's like that storyline? Right. I don't know. That's going to be exactly. hard. So we're going to let you guys know. We always do, and we'll I'll be doing the research. But uh, Perk, great discussion topic here. Thanks for uh, submitting the question for us. Um, up next, we're going to head back over some baseball prospects real quick. Justin Stewart, excited for Jackson Cur Churio cards that I have to sell. Disappointment was that Tyler Black didn't get called up, uh, and he was playing great. Thoughts on Tyler Black's cards? Paul says, have a quite a stack of them. I Hey, Justin, great to hear from you. Thanks for all of your support, as always. Uh, good to see you in the live chat, my man. Yeah, Tyler Black, I mean, I know he's someone that, that lefties mentioned, I, he hasn't been someone that's been on my radar just because he's a little bit too far down for me. So from a, I know he's one of the Brewers top prospects. Um, I don't know where he sits. Okay. So he's sorry. He's 46th overall on the MLB top 100. Yeah. He does have that expected arrival uh, of 2024. So I, I actually think, I just wanted to validate that I think this is a simple answer. And I think I've just validated that just, just seeing that he is in the top 50 and that he does have an arrival expected arrival of uh, 2024. So he's a Nashville sounds guy. So Connor and I should be very familiar with who he is. Um, just, just, if you got a stack of them, the answer's simple, Justin, you're just, he's going to get called up. Like he's going to get called up this year. Uh, it just didn't happen. If you already got a stack, I would not buy more. If you don't have a stack and you want to make some money on black, maybe go look at his prices. If they dip after this non-call up or non non uh, spring training break with the Brewers, he goes back down to Nashville. Maybe his cards go down a little bit to where you can make a quick flip. I do not necessarily recommend that, but if you love baseball prospecting, it could be a play. But Justin, for people like yourself and others who already have a stack of black, just hold tight. When you get that call up news, list them. And you're gonna at this point, you're gonna you're gonna take what you can get at the call up for a guy like Tyler Black. This is a top 50, not a top five, a top 50 guy. And there's a huge difference. So that's why I typically like look, I love lefty and i love everybody who does these like penny stock baseball prospect the deep cuts i listen to lefty cards the deep cuts right connor i love the deep cuts but the deep cuts they don't always they don't always bring the profits they, they could bring the fun but they could also leave you with a stack of black that doesn't necessarily profit we'll see what happens i hope justin and others make money at the call up but the reality is that You've got the Jordan Lawlers of the world from last year. You've got the Junior Camineros of the world from last year. You get guys who get called up and their cards don't really pop. So you could get stuck. But I wish you well. Let us know what happens with your Tyler Black. Shout out to our guy, Mr. Steiner, in the live chat. Says, thanks for the content info. My 30-day free trial was up yesterday and I subscribed. Gunther, if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, let me know. Yell at me. But Gunther Steiner, we appreciate the support. Thanks for subscribing. I'm it's, sure Paul's got something to say. The American pronunciation is probably Gunther, but it's it could be Gunther, potentially. But yes, thank you for your support. Appreciate you. Good to see you uh, subscribe and stay subscribed after that trial, baby. That's just when things start to get good after your 30 days. Speaking of getting good, we've had some good topic chats in the live chat, some of it being vintage baseball, some talk about Willie Mays, Paul, that you starred here. So I'm going to let you break down what you've got to say and kind of take things away. I actually really don't have any shame in my game when it comes to the fact that let's just let's just call it like it is. Like Willie Mays uh, is 93, and uh, while I do hope for great health for everyone in the world, people die, people pass away, 
death is a selling marker. It just is. And so you can say morally this, morally that, should we this, should we that. People potentially like Fern, people potentially like Boudini's cards and comics, mentioning Willie Mays, may or may not be buying Willie Mays with the selling marker of death. I think our guy Chase Krim at Texas Roadshow Shop is because I heard him on Lefty Cards on Monday talk with Lefty about Willie Mays being his goat that he's buying right now. So Krim had to call you out. I think it's great. I, I think it's smart. Like, first of all, it's Willie Mays. So whether or not you're buying him with the selling marker of death or not, it's Willie Mays. So you can't argue with the fact greatest center fielder of all time, even though I like Ken Griffey Jr. Willie Mays is the greatest center fielder of all time. Top, what, three, four baseball player of all time in Major League history. So um, I, I really, really, I really think Willie Mays is probably, as you would say, Connor, criminally undervalued as a vintage baseball guy. So that's why I started. I just wanted to comment on it. Thanks to Fern, Alan Ma, Boudini's Cards and Comics, everybody else in the live chat. Also kind of a funny discussion. Uh, this will be my parting shot for the show, Connor, and then I'll let you uh, say any parting shots that you have for this phenomenal episode of the Sports Card Strategy Show. But a lot of humorous banter in the live chat having to do with uh, the Dave Ramsey of sports cards. So I want to thank everybody for listening to the Sports Card Strategy Show today. If you're on Apple, Spotify, and you couldn't be in the live chat, look, we love you just as much as we love our live chat people. Hopefully you find the show entertaining. You can join the Discord, sportscardstrategy.com. Follow us on Instagram, sportscardstrategy. Comment on that phenomenal question of the day from Connor Barnett. Thanks to Eric Stefano in the house. He got in. He's a, a buzzer beater on the live chat. He's usually either last in the live chat or first to comment on the YouTube video. So appreciate you, Eric Stefano. Connor, what do you got before we hit him with the outro? I'm flag planning that this was the most fun I've had on a sports card strategy show episode. It was an absolute blast to be here talking with you and with all of our awesome supporters, members, family of nooffseason.com and sports card strategy show. As a birthday gift, I have a call to action. I want 100 comments on this YouTube video, not in the live chat. When the, when the video is done, I want us to get 100 comments. So as a birthday present to me, guys, after this video is done live streaming and it is a posted video on youtube.com slash Paul Hickey, please comment on it. Let us know what you would tell newcomers in terms of uh, getting into the hobby with a good tip. And thank you guys for all the fantastic support as always. Make Connor's birthday a good one. Comment below. Love everybody. Have a great day. Connor, I'll see you in person in about five hours. Everybody else, we'll see you soon too. Have a good one. Thanks so much for being here with us on the Sports Card Strategy Show. To connect with us further, please subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Paul Hickey. Please also give us a follow on Instagram at Sports Card Strategy and on X at No Off Season Card. We also have a Discord that you could join at sportscardstrategy.com. Everyone, I'm Paul Hickey. For the rest of us here at nooffseason.com, have a great day. We'll see you again soon.